welcome back. This is part two to a called out assembly. I have several pieces that they all seem to, they all do. They, they intertwine and, and bring out all the more this matter of a called out assembly. So let me read this. Some of this kind of repetitious, but it's, repetition is good for us. We all have heard that the word church defined as a called out assembly. Called out of both the sect world and the religious world to a whole new way. The early called out something was originally called the way. We can't use this because there are groups today that have distorted this term. There's a group out there called the way. So I've asked for new terms to describe what it is I will be offering here on this uh, website. Or I got this out. I'm coming out with a blog. Books, blogs where I'm putting these books. Also I'll bring it out here on YouTube. And I also send this out via email to many people. So uh, I believe you all know that there are millions upon millions of established websites reporting to have the truth that see what they are saying to be the only way. This is a fulfillment of prophecy which the Apostle Paul warned us about in his letter to Timothy of how in the end times they would heap teachers to themselves. If ever, if ever this was true, today is that day. Go on the web, you know what I mean. What I want to share on this site will not be just another teacher in the heap. I don't want to be just another teacher in the heap. You know? As a matter of fact, I am not claiming to be a teacher at all. I will only be sharing what I believe the teacher, which is the Holy Spirit, of us all, has revealed through this earthen vessel, this uh, treasure hidden, that the excellency be of God, not me, Paul Wood. I have enough peace to bring that out here in a minute. If you desire to follow a particular teacher found on the web, mainstream religious denomination, or offshoots calling themselves independent churches, then this this site at this moment is not for you. If you don't, if that's what you want, go do that. I'm not here to try to sucker you into uh, following the teachings of Paul Woodrum. Uh, I'll be bringing more out on that fact. I desire that the Holy Spirit draw you here. The same Holy Spirit has done His pre-salvation work and would be calling you not only out of this world, but also out of what the scriptures call self-willed religion. This pre-salvation work of the Holy Spirit would not be drawing those after the will of their carnal soul, or what's called the, the flesh, the traditions of men, the iniquities of their parents, you know, which is heavily influenced by the world, the flesh, the devil, or the opinions, ideas, views, perspectives of the human mind, cut off from their spirits, thus not seen here, from uh, God the Father of the Spirit. Here's what here's what, here's not what I'm doing. Here's it's not what I desire. We do not want to start another denomination. I'm not trying trying to start a uh, Woodyites, <laughs> Woodwardites. You know, a center cult, another uh, another denomination. We do not want to build another building or gathering place. I, I have no ambition to start a church, a building. You know, with a label and denomination on. We do not desire our will over the will of our true Father. We do not desire, as has been said, to throw the baby out with the bathwater. There's elements of that come up out of the institutional church religion that they sound uh, that they're in agreement with. I'm agreeing with them; they're in agreement with me. But as far as their institutions and their buildings and the programs, there's a difference there. We do not want to focus on the things seen, but rather on matters not seen. We do not want to. The reality of this world to cloud out the reality of that, that world to come. We do not want to start an attack of those who have, by an act of their free will, chose not to join this site. If you, no, I'm not asking you to join here. You know, if you already got a church and you, know, you follow a preacher, teacher, a minister, I mean, a denomination, I'm not here to try to draw you out of there. That's up to the Holy Spirit. We do not desire to judge things before their time. That's Paul's warning. We don't do that. No, we're not. We're all staying for the judgment seat of Christ. We do not want any bonds of iniquity or gall bitterness to interfere with the purpose of this site. Come here because you got, you know, by bonds of iniquity, I'll explain it right here. It means hang-ups coming from our upbringing, anger against parents, uh, teachers and preachers, you know, individuals in general which have caused bitterness in our soulish emotions and thoughts. We do not want the motives of these Carnal emotions and thoughts to block our true emotion and thoughts that God desires to express through our quickened human spirits. Well, that's one piece. Let me see now. I'm going to find this other piece. 
Oh, where am I at now here? Well, don't make, there's no set order. I'm just going to give you this one. Greetings to the Court Out Assembly. This is our Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23 through 29. That's my paraphrase of the and the living word of what Hebrews chapter 12, 23 to 29 is saying. So catch this. By reason of time, and after all the emails, videos I've sent to you all, those I was sending you stuff out to, and the YouTube videos on YouTube, I send you greetings once again to this small assembly of those called out, those of the firstborn established before the foundations of the world, whose names are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to your human spirits justified, made perfect before the foundation of the world, and the second of religious opinions. I directed you to Jesus, the mediator of the eternal covenant, and to his blood slain before the foundation of the world, blood which was sprinkled on the true altar, which speaks better thing than the blood of evil. See that you fuse not this one that I have been led to direct you to, this one that speaks, spake from the true reality. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth by the prophets and the apostles, much more shall not you escape if you turn away from him that speaks from heaven, the true reality, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised before the foundation of the world, saying, Yet once more I will shake not the earth only, but also heaven, heaven where iniquity began, the iniquity there will be cast down, Lucifer being cast down. This word, once more, signifies this casting down of Lucifer and all things that can be shaken in heaven and on earth, but you receive the kingdom that cannot be shaken, a kingdom prepared before the foundations of the world and now offered to the grace of God, making you acceptable. In reverence and good sense of godly fear, you look forward to meeting a father who is a consuming fire, a fire that is cleansing and not destructive, as it will be for those who have not reverence, have not this reverence godly fear. Amen. That's one, one more piece. Let me get another piece going here. This is the message to the church. Message to the church, March uh, 2015. Now, this is the parable of the two sons in the light of the end times. Now, follow me on this. Matthew 21, 28. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go today and work today in the vineyard. I will, he answered. But later he changed his mind. Will not, oh, he said, I will not. I've got to get my writing, reading right here. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? They answered, the first. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. The tax collector and the prostitutes are any the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness. You did not believe him. But the tax collector and the prostitute did. did and even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. So what are we to focus on in this parable? What application can we be made to our generation or personally, right? We all know that Jesus was speaking in this situation to self-righteous Pharisees who were of those who had said that they would go work in the vineyard, yet didn't. Their rejection of Jesus proved this fact. Jesus came and found them not working. Now focused on changed his mind. Think about it. Here's a father saying to his first son, go out and work in the vineyard. His son says that he won't. Imagine you saying that to your son <laughs> and him replying that way. What reaction would you have to a son like that? Well, in this case, the father just turns and looks to another son, asking him to go and work. This son says, sure, dad, I'll get right to it. There you discover that he lied. Hear that? He lied. 
and never worked in a vineyard. Yet the son that Bladen said that he wouldn't go to work in, is discovered working in a vineyard, having changed his mind later on. So what do we see in this? The father would not have forced either son to work. Not about our righteousness, not about our work. But it comes out that the father doesn't like this idea of saying you will go, and then you don't. You still ha have time to change your mind. For those you listen to this, what do you say? Those of you reading this at this moment. See if you can catch the just one, what I'm bringing out here. As for the Jewish leaders, they gave every impression that they were working in God's vineyard. Question is, were they? John the Baptist called them to work. What was the work? It was the work of getting individuals to turn around. Called repentance definition. Sounds like an easy job, right? Also to have them get prepared for something. What were they preparing for? John said it. The kingdom of heaven was near. He was to make straight paths for him, Jesus the Messiah. What would they be doing to get the people prepared in this work? Well, straighten out their thinking or changing their minds. Well, the religious leader didn't want to change, even if they heard the message to change. For one, they were an illusion that they were working in the vineyard, when in truth, they were not. They had their idea of what the vineyard and work was and had to be done and didn't want to change their mind of just what the work was. They saw it as hard work and would boast of how hard they were working, you know, trying to gain God's favor. John's idea of work was easy. So they rejected him and his message and continued to do what they thought was the work of God. Thus, though they had said that they would go to work to do the work of God, go to the vineyard, they didn't. Later on, those that were not seeking him, find him. Those that bluntly, by their demonstration of lifestyle, tax collector, prostitute, etc., hear John's message and receive it. His message wasn't like the message of the religious leader they observed around them. He simply told them that the kingdom was near, turn around, change their minds, secular and religious, and start looking for it, as he was. Then one day John sees him and shouts, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin, S-I-N, of the world. Now sins, that comes later. He has to deal with the sin nature. Now today... We have heard this quoted so many times that we have no idea what it meant to do it that day, especially to the crowd and not as much to the religious crowd. A prostitute or a tax collector without a doubt understood this word, sin. The religious crowd made sure that they heard this day after day with demonstrations of hate and judgment to boot. But here's John saying in such a way that those so-called sinners flock to him and go into the vineyard to do the work needed. What was John saying and doing that was different and drew them to him? Well, first of all, when these self-righteous Pharisees showed up the river where John was, baptizing him, he asked them, What are you doing here? <laughs> that's my own paraphrase. Well, let's read Matthew uh, chapter 3, verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Yeah. Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance, and think not to say when yourself, We have Abraham as our father, by saying to you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewed down and cast into fire. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mortal than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Whose fan is in his hand, he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the granure, but he will burn up the share with unquenchable fire. John, in a single breath, embraces past, present, future. So he's speaking for what I come to see as the now. 
In other words, statements directly from God himself, who can see the past of those that, that day and today, their present situation, and what the future held in store for them. Amazing. Now focus on the wrath to come. Was John speaking about something future? Think with me on this. If you told a servant to go to the vineyard, and he said that he would, yet you find out later that he lied to you, would you be angry? <laughs> then you confront him, and still he just doesn't get it, and still doesn't go to venue. Wouldn't you think that this strong, this strong word of wrath might come into play? Now focus on the present situation with John that day. What wrath would these Jewish religious face some sixty years later for rejecting Messiah, their king and kingdom? History reveals it. The Romans destroyed their temple and scattered them all over the face of the earth. God's wrath using Rome to accomplish this. A warning. Jesus himself pronounced them, saying not one stone would rain, remain upon another, and that their kingdom would be postponed until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Luke chapter 21, verse 20 to 24. John sees this wrath coming. Why? Luke 21, 22. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. The Old Testament predicted the rejecting the Messiah. John saw it coming, and Jesus declared it. He reminds them of the warning, and they lived to see all things which are written fulfilled up to verse 24 of Luke 21. Beyond verse 24 is, is our time, our turn to see the vengeance of the Lord with this vengeance starting as they did back then with the house of God and our religious leaders. Now catch what follows, for it pertains to us. The Jews rejected their king and postponed their kingdom. God doesn't change his mind. They will get their kingdom during the 1,000 year reign of their king, Jesus, returning. Well, that's for the Jewish nation, a time of Jacob's trouble. Now I want to speak to his church, this so-called called-out assembly. He now is waiting for us to change our minds, repent, and you can hear John's message shouted once again as we proclaim as as was proclaimed as Jesus first coming, now his second coming, prepare the way, make straight paths, repent church church, turn around and face the king in the kingdom prepared for you before the foundations of the world. Turn, change your minds and ideas of a kingdom, of a building, and embrace a kingdom not made with hands. Allow the spirit to wean you from all of us. Let me wrap this up and bring it home. Ask yourself this question. What is the work in working in a vineyard? Think of one word, single word, pruning. What is pruning? For those of you who might not know, it would be cutting out the dead branches in the fall to allow the new sprouts in the spring to grow. If pruning is done, it will save the vineyard, as strange as this might sound, and look. If you saw a vineyard after pruning, it would appear to be destructive, yet it is the life of the vineyard. If you didn't cut away the excessive branches, you, you might get grapes next season, but the quality or quantity would not be there. The Jewish people rejecting their king fulfilled God's promise to Abraham to bless all nations. By his seed, Christ. God at this point postpones his promise to Israel as a nation, a kingdom, and turns to the Gentile world to save them. Thus his eternal will is established for the world that none will perish. The offer is once for all established. Remember his name was Abraham? Abram, they changed to Abraham. He said he would not be the father of the Jewish nation, but of the whole world. So death, burial, and the rejection uh, of Jesus Christ as their king was a fulfillment of a promise that God promised to make him a father of many nations. And he turns from the Jew, to whom he went to first, who rejects him. And in that, he, they, they don't realize that they're fulfilling that God's promise to save the world. And through that, he turns to the Gentiles and saves all men gone. For God so loved the world, that gave his only begotten Son. Loves us all. What am I seeing in all this? Hear what the Lord is saying. Soon, very soon, what might be seen as a destructive act, this called out assembly will undergo weaning. 
with God using the present government to accomplish this. They will think that it is the hand of the devil or the corrupt government. Big Brother coming against their religious faith. No, it will be allowed of God himself to prepare his son's bride. Those things which were intended to be temporal, loud of God, the church building and programs will be attacked and dissolved. If we would judge ourselves, we would not need the world to judge us. This is a time to build up. There's a time to build up. A time to tear down. It is now time to tear down. Imagine the reaction to such a message to the churches today. That's why the world will do it. They won't do it themselves. For they're hooked on the status quo. Can you imagine you going to a local mega church with such a message that sees himself as rich? When to the eyes of God they're wretched, blind, poor, and naked. Go in there among the thousands that fill these places and see if they would embrace your message. What may have been tolerated by God in the past at the consummation of this age will end up by our either hearing what the Spirit is saying to the churches or seeing the world do what they were been told to do by the Lord unaware. I rest my peace. I have delivered this message. Oh, God. That's... Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I, I'm not welcome in a church for for this message. Let me see if I can find got another piece here. Uh, let me take this one, the woman the well. The woman the well. Okay, this is getting beyond the debates of race, creeds, and culture. And also place of worship. People try to say, well, you're just jealous because you don't have a church. You don't have a building. You don't have a congregation. Now, I get labeled with that. I'm not doing that. I'm not I'm not sitting here trying to attack the institutional church. I'm just telling you things God told me to share. I'm sharing them. And you do what you want to do with it. So here are the woman at the well. Let's see what we can get out of this. Get beyond the debates of race, creeds, and culture. This is what happens in this situation. A question once asked by a dear sister in Christ on the sin of the woman at the well. She asked me, what was the sin of the, what was the woman at the well sin? <laughs> good question which has an answer to start with see sin as our acting independent from God in our ways do that every time you see the word sin acting independent from God acting independent from God you could be doing what appears as good but if you haven't acknowledged God for his input to your actions or speaking you're sinning or acting independent of God Lean on it to thy own understanding, but always acknowledge him, and God will direct your path. Have you asked him? <laughs> okay, let's get read on. So, with that understand, let's sit at this well scene and listen to what was said between Jesus and this Samaritan woman. This is found in John chapter 4. Well, Jesus' disciples had left and gone into the city to purchase food. Jesus is sitting at the well, and this Samaritan woman, a mixed breed of Jew and Gentile, which the Jews never talk to, seeing him as sinners for a mixed marriage, shows up to get water from the well. Her sin at this point isn't the racial issue. Jesus avoids this stupid issue in the context of this story and simply asks her for her for water. He didn't bring up the fact she was Samaritan. The other Jews probably would have argued with her. Get away from the well, get away from me, you you contaminate the water, contaminate me. No? Jesus gets right to the point. The real issue and says to him, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for water so he could drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So now we start seeing her sin. Here's her sin. And that her spirit was cut off from God and couldn't perceive who she was talking to. She talked to the Son of God. As a son of man, Jesus. She has a soulless carnal view of Jesus. She sees him as a Jew. She's a, she's a mixed breed and they know the argument. She's just going with that old mentality. Understand our sin nature would keep us from seeing Jesus as the son of God in place. So the Holy Spirit is first starting to convict her of this sin nature. Remember that? The Holy Spirit was left by Jesus. He's convicted of the sin, righteousness, and judgment. There's not a whole piece I brought out. So that here's the Holy Spirit working through Jesus, the Son of Man, and he's trying to convict this woman of her sin nature. First of all, Jesus mentioned the gift of God. 
Jesus was the gift of God. She, not seeing the Son of God in flesh, was missing this gift of God, Jesus, the Son of Man. Moving on now in this story, her carnal thinking, which reveals her dormant spirit, her carnal thinking can't get past the idea of water. She can't can't see how Jesus could ever give her water when he doesn't even have a bucket of rope to get water. Crazy. Well, we know he, he wasn't talking about H2O water. So, once again, her sin is her carnal mind or soulish intellect inability to comprehend a spiritual metaphor. Her spirit is awake at this moment. Jesus continues the spiritual metaphor, saying, Whoever drinks of the water that I give them shall never thirst, and this water will be a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. Once again, she is in Gideon and thinks of some kind of magical water, and says, yeah, give me this kind of water. <laughs> you know? Now Jesus, the evening spiritual metaphors, starts, uh, really starts driving his point home to get her to see who he is by using her life as a means to do this. He says to her, great, go, call your husband, have him come here. She gives a half-truth, says, saying she has no husband, Jesus says, you are correct. You have no husband, but you have had five husbands, and the man that you are living with now isn't your husband. Now at this point, she starts getting past just seeing Jesus as a Jewish man. Her spiritual senses start to kick in. She says to him, I perceive that you are a prophet. Well, she was correct. Not only was Jesus a prophet, but also would become a great high priest and coming king. Her view had improved to the point that now she's getting concerned, afraid, convicted. See, the Holy Spirit doing his job. So she quickly changes the subject now. How do we do that? Our, our conscience accuses us and we excuse it, change the subject, you know. She, so she quickly changes the subject, seeks to involve Jesus in a distracting argument. Her argument is a religious debate over place of worship. Now, others do that with me when I'm trying to bring out this truth about the cold out something. They get into a religious bait uh, over the place of worship. The Samaritan worship, worshiping in the mountains and the Jews worshiping in the temple. You know? Once again, Jesus avoids the argument so he can get to the real issue at hand, having her wake up to who he really is. He says to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you shall not worship God in this mountain, nor the Jew in the temple, but will finally wake up and realize that God our Father has always desired that we worship Him in truth and in our quickened, awakened, dormant spirits, seeing beyond this limited carnal souls and physical experience to a true reality that is eternal and not temporal. That's my paraphrase of that particular text. It's powerful. That's exactly what he was saying. Now, for the first time, her spirit is beginning to wake up. She recalls the promise of a deliverer, the Messiah. She makes the connection that he would tell us all things. Things like her sin nature, her acts of this sin nature, her five husbands, etc. It is then that Jesus says to her, Wake in spirit, I, the one that is speaking to you, am he. She is shaken to the point that she forgets all about water, the well, and her container, and runs back to town, excited. She had met the Messiah. You know the rest of the story. So her sin isn't the racial issue as the Jews might have thought, or any particular sin in her case being divorced five times and currently living out of wedlock with a man. Her sin was of nature. We were all born with blinding us, from seeing who Jesus really was, our Savior, our Deliverer, our Messiah, our great High Priest and coming King. But now, as a woman at the well, we see him. God bless you, Cindy. Now is the power of peace. Let me pause. I'm saying to myself, oh, God, thank you. Thank you for what Jesus did. Thank you for who he was. Thank you, Father. Let me pause a minute. Ah, oh, Lord, that was, oh, thank you, Father. Another piece, Church Beyond the Institution. 
This video is in no way hindering anyone from going to an institution church of one season. Don't think I'm doing that. I know that the church has an institu institutional structure has its purpose and I let them function as they function without hindrance. But for those who, for one reason or another, <clears throat> have been turned off the church, now if you've seen it, this video might be for you. It might be for you. I personally am not seeking to start another church. I've said this already. You know. There are plenty of them on just about every street corner in the average town. Take your pick. I come to see what I'm doing as someone who stands between the secular world and the religious world, representing either one. It's called Gap. God's available person, God's available present, God's anointed person. What I will be offering reaches beyond both of these. My videos on YouTube touch matters before the foundation world, after its end, and everything in between. This video, in particular, represents my true aim and purpose, and will leave you without a doubt to the understanding that I am not forming a cult, new age church or new religion. My main focus is to bring you to the understanding that God has always loved you since the beginning of this world and never desired you be cut off from him. So with that said, let me share now with you what God through me has offered you, has to offer you. Let me pause a minute. Well, I've called this piece Old Lamps for New. At times it's hard to share truth especially when you know that you are learning the same truth along with those that you're sharing with. You know, I ain't arrived yet, not by any reason of the word. It has to be shared, not intended to be judgmental, because we know that what we many times judge others of, it boomerangs back on us because we do the same thing. Speaking the truth, knowing what I just said, that we are in a learning process along with others keeps these expressed truths from coming back on me. We are all, to some degree, still walking what's called our flesh, not waiting for the leading of the Holy Spirit to our human awakening spirit. Believe it or not, spiritual answers come through our human spirits quickened by the Holy Spirit, not books, tapes, videos, or even this email or this video I'm making now. These things should lead us to this end which is written, As many that are led of the Spirit, these are the matured sons of God. Time brings this maturity. We see this expressed by the Apostle Paul when he addressed those he had instructed over a period of time. By reason of time, you should understand what I'm saying, but you're dull of hearing. By reason of time, we mature to where we get past tutors and guides who are called to bring and who were called to bring us to maturity, desired of our Father. You may not know this at this moment, but in reality, what God accomplished before the foundation, we are already complete. We're complete in Him. Comes out in the book of Colossians. Fully matured sons of God, created in Christ Jesus. I've got verses below. we we'll bring this out. The Holy Spirit, as we yield to His sanctifying work, works out what is already complete in us. Understand this fact removes any fear that we may have in losing what we have held on to for most of our lives. The old saying is correct. We're exchanging old lamps for new. That's what I'm offering. A whole new lamp. A new being, a new reality, a new sense of power. That's what God came to accomplish in the flesh. To free us from this world. The old lamps lacks the genie, or as scripture calls it, the treasure hidden in the earthen vessel. God gives God give God him the old lamp and learn to rub, polish the new. See what happens. <laughs> okay. Let me wrap this up and give some con uh, concluding thoughts to off these verses. Complete in him, this comes out of Colossians two ten, and you are complete in him, which is ahead of all principalities and powers. Before the foundations of the world. To the faith of Jesus Christ. Who ultimately finished that faith. And that faith is an expression between God the Father. And God the Son. And is empowered by the Holy Spirit. That God so loved the world. That he did not want any of us to perish. He takes an injustice from Adam. 
and cracks it to what's called justification. I bring this out over and over again in my writings, in my videos, in my emails. Your salvation problems were solved before you were born. He lit every man that came into the world. Read the Gospel of John for opening chapter. To many has received this. To them gave he the right to be called sons and daughters of God. You're born to Adam, you're a son or daughter of Adam. That's an injustice. I would have to suffer the, the wrath of God because of simply being born on this planet to the loins of a fallen couple. God corrected that. He's a just God. And he corrected the injustice. Christ was slain before the foundation of God. The blood of the Son was sprinkled on the altar of heaven where the iniquity began. Treasures in earth and vessels. Second Corinthians 4, 7. But we have this treasure and earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, as any man would boast. There's no boasting. It can't be of works, because the work under the book of Ephesians was finished before the world began. How can you add to or take away from that finished work of the Son of God slain before the foundation of the world? There is no sacrifice. That can take that place. And anything that we saw demonstrated in this time, space, and material world and the past through the Jewish sacrificial lamb without spot or blemish and the representation of that land as John said, Behold the Lamb of God on the cross was a demonstration of an eternal fact solved, corrected before the fall of Adam, before we were born. God corrected. He would have never sent you into a world to be trapped. He knew he'd give you a way to escape, and how will you escape if you neglect so great a salvation? It was finished before you were born. You don't have to work this or earn it. It's a gift. If I gave you a gift for your birthday, and you turned around wanting to pay me for that gift, I'd be offended. It's free. You can't work it. You can't earn it. The gift. Receive it. It's promised of God. Work out of salvation. And <laughs> when we get that twisted all to hell. Wherefore, by me, love, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He had already told me everything I've been telling you. Christ in them, the hope of glory. Before the foundation of the world, before the foundation of the world, Paul used that statement over and over and over again. Christ in you. The justification work of the Father. Placing you from a son daughter of Adam to a son and daughter of God. You receive that, you become a son and daughter of, of God again. He reinstates you. Full, complete. Son or daughter of God, and you work out what He puts in you that treasure that's hidden in this earth and vessel. You work it out, open up the treasure chest, work out salvation with fear and trembling. <laughs> the flesh is fearful and trembling. Do I dare trust God, or do I have to work my way? Going about establishing their righteousness, they have forfeited the righteousness of God. Still fall into that trap. Romans chapter 10. Corner mind, 1 Corinthians 3 1. And I, brethren, would not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I don't know what these people are teaching. Some, I, I hear some of these ministers and some of the churches and I, I've been to them and I hear them on the web and some, you know, they're beautiful men they're bringing out this truth others are adding to or taking away for what we're saying here you can't add to the finished work of God or take away from it if you do, you try it under the foot his finished work and you go the way it came whole new video I got out on the web. You forfeit what God established before he was born. So that's the end of this. So I'm going to end it. That's 39 minutes long. I think. <laughs> so God bless you. I hope you got something out of this. 
And uh, maybe I might be being more out of this. I think this may be it for now. So God bless you.